Hello, New Prospect family. Hope you're doing well. Welcome once again to Bible 101. And I hope you have had a great week so far. I hope you're looking forward to our time of worship and celebration on Sunday as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Hope you are praying uh, that God will prepare your heart for that. And as we gather together to fellowship and remember what Christ has done for us, his body that was broken for us, his blood that was shed for us, and pray that God will prepare our hearts for that celebration. But today we're continuing our journey through the New Testament books. If you remember, uh, last week we uh, said that we were going to kind of start going uh, book by book through the rest of the New Testament to kind of um, make sure that we're moving forward on this. Uh, so we did Galatians last week. We're doing Ephesians this week. So if you haven't had an opportunity yet, I encourage you to go ahead and pause the video and you can read through these short uh, six chapters and just get a, a good flow uh, idea of the flow and argument that Paul's making here in this in this letter. And there's just so much richness uh, to be found in this letter. Uh, you guys will will certainly laugh at this. The, this is, I think, one of uh, one of the the richest books in the New Testament. Maybe my favorite book in the New Testament as well. I love the book of Ephesians. There is a just a beauty in Paul's expression here, uh, and there's so much that's not just theologically rich, but also uh, practically poignant uh, for us today. Uh, and so uh, looking forward to, to studying with you in just, in just a minute. But before we do that, let's begin with prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for how you have revealed yourself to us. And we thank you for all the blessings that we have that are in Christ. Father, I pray that we would um, be enriched in our uh, fellowship just by our time in, the, in your word today. And we pray that you reveal yourself to us. And may we uh, come away from our study uh, loving you more and uh, desiring to serve you more uh, and hold up the name of Jesus in our world around us. And we thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So uh, let's uh, begin. I want to begin by just giving you kind of a basic overview of some of the issues um, regarding uh, the letter to the church at Ephesus. And I'll, I'll, in doing so, I'll kind of explain what's uh, going on with my virtual background as well. And I've got another virtual background to share with you in just a minute as well. Uh, but uh, the letter of Ephesians is uh, something of a controversial letter in Pauline studies. There are some who believe that Paul didn't even write it. I don't think that's the, the case. Uh, there's also a disagreement over who he is actually writing to. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice about the text is that in, um, in, the, in Paul's greeting, which is a pre fairly typical greeting, uh, he has the, there's the phrase that he's writing to the saints who are at Ephesus. And um, that phrase in Ephesus or at Ephesus is actually missing in some of the earliest manuscripts of the, of the letter to the church at Ephesus. And so some think uh, that Paul was not just writing specifically to that church, but he meant this to be a letter that would be passed around, something of what we might call an encyclical letter or a tractate letter that would be passed around. Uh, to uh, the various churches in the region. Of course, Ephesus was one of the larger cities in Asia Minor, right there on the coast, and perhaps one of the largest cities in the, uh, the Greco-Roman world. And I think it's maybe the, the second or third largest city in the Greco-Roman world at the time. So major uh, city, a uh, very influential place, and Paul loved this uh, place. He loved the city. Spent quite a bit of time here on his uh, missionary journeys and loved the church there. Uh, and you see, I think, something that in his letter uh, reflected here. Uh, he spent, um, uh, he, he performed some, uh, some pretty amazing uh, ministry uh, while he was there at Ephesus as well. And of course, Ephesus was known for a lot of different things. Uh, but one of the major things it was known for, and even known for today, is that it was the center of the worship of the, of the Greek god Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, and also the protector of virgins. Uh, and it is uh, one of the ancient wonders of the, the wonders of the seven wonders of the ancient world because uh, of just the, the, not just how it was built uh, and, and the final structure, but where it was built. And so what, what is behind me is actually a, a model uh, of uh, kind of a, I'm assuming, I'm not sure if this is uh, kind of a small scale model of what it would have been like. Uh, but there was 121 columns, marble columns on this, uh, on this temple, if you can imagine that. And it was actually built in a swamp. Uh, so they actually had to, and 
there's some theories about why it was built there. I think there was a theory that there, and this is somewhat even reflected in the biblical text that a meteor may have hit, hit this area uh, and they believed it was from the gods, something like that. Um, by the way, there, you can almost, you can kind of see this too. There was an opening, eh, you can't really see it. Up uh, here, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Up there, there's a, uh, there was a uh, opening uh, which allowed the light to shine on a huge statue of the, the goddess in the middle of the temple. And so this was a, uh, this was kind of the, the uh, center of the town and um, even a center of some of the industry in the town, particularly uh, silversmiths who made little goddesses uh, to sell. Uh, in the town of little goddesses of Artemis. And as Paul began to preach, and he preached, of course, the, the one true God, Jesus, uh, as revealed in Jesus Christ, and uh, preaching against idolatry, this started to cut into some of uh, the silversmith business. And so, and we read in Acts chapter 19, uh, you see that there was a silversmith uh, named Demetrius who uh, gets a little bit upset, and there's a riot that's caused, uh, and it ends up where people uh, going into the, the theater, um, dragging along some of the, the traveling companions of Paul, and they start shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, uh, until finally uh, they're, um, the proconsuls, I'm sorry, um, they're uh, one of the the leaders in the city finally uh, helped to disperse this this crowd, this riot that's going on uh, because of, of Paul. And so um, it's an interest, interesting uh, story, interesting background. Uh, and of course, this is the this church that sends Paul back uh, to Jerusalem uh, with a very tearful farewell uh, towards the end of the book of Acts as well. I think in the very next chapter is where we find that, yep, yeah, in chapter 20. Uh, so, uh, a, a church that, that Paul definitely loved, uh, by the way, this is, I think, instructive. So I want to see if I can, um, I want to change my video out here. So I don't know if you can, all right, there we go. This is what the, uh, temple looks like now. There's one kind of hodgepodge column that's been reconstructed, uh, Earthquakes in the area and things like that have caused it to be destroyed. And of course, where it was built in the, in the first place. Um, tells us something about uh, man-made wonders, doesn't it? That um, some things don't last uh, and some things do. The church that Paul um, uh, invested in, the church that Christ is still building even today, it's lasted. Uh, this temple uh, that was an, an uh, wonder of the ancient world has not lasted. So um, let's jump right in then to our um, to our letter. And uh, one of the things I also love about the book of Ephesians is it's a very has a very uh, uh, discernible structure. So the very the it's six chapters, half of it exactly. Uh, the first three chapters deal with more theological issues on the part of Paul. Uh, so he kind of gives a theological background for some of it, his admonitions. And then when we get to chapter four, we have this therefore. And with that therefore, Paul takes all the, the indicatives. In other words, the things that he stated are true because we are in Christ, uh, are true about our salvation, are true about the gospel. Then he starts to talk about, well, what are the practical outflows of that, the imperatives that come from that? Uh, so this is what we know is true. Then he exhorts the people based on that truth. And that's really what um, any kind of preaching is, right? You take the truth and then you exhort based on that truth. And this is what Paul is doing to that for that uh, church at Ephesus is he's exhorting based on the truth that, uh, that he has proclaimed to them in the gospel. So uh, let's kind of march through some of the, that theological richness that we find here in these first uh, few chapters of Ephesians. And the very first thing that we come to after, I'm not going to spend any time on the, um, on the greeting. It's, again, a fairly typical greeting. But in starting in verse 3 and going all the way down to verse 14, this is one long sentence in the Greek. It's almost as if Paul takes this deep breath and then starts just 
expounding, and of course he's writing it down, but he's just started expounding uh, all the different things that we have that are now in Christ. And he starts, the, the kind of the theme here that you'll see, uh, he starts with a blessing. And this is, again, fairly typical of Paul's letters. Blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ. We see this, by the way, in 2 Corinthians uh, that we just dealt with a few weeks ago. Uh, and then uh, he says three times over to the praise, all these things that are going on here are to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. Verse 6, verse 12, and verse 14. But then what he's really, what is it to, that's to the praise of his glory? Why is God blessed? Well, he, he proceeds in this one long sentence to expound on all the different spiritual blessings that we have uh, in Christ. In verse 3, he has blessed us with every, not, not just partial, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places with Christ. So if you want to take some time today and just meditate on the greatness of the salvation that we have, this is a great place to start. Uh, so what are some of those uh, blessings? Well, we have, for instance, we have this, um, the, the, uh, the loving selection, election of, of believers that he talks about. He chose us before the foundations of the world. He, had pre he adopted us, verse 5, uh, as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, brought into the family of God. Uh, he has, and this was done according to the kind intention of his will, uh, he has freely bestowed on us in the beloved um, all these different things. He has given us redemption. So he's bought us with a price, uh, redeemed us from slavery to, to sin and to death. Uh, he's given us forgiveness, verse 7, of our, of our sins and fulfillment of the promises of the new covenant according to the riches of his grace. He's lavished on us uh, and, and wisdom and insight. He's, he's uh, made known to us the the mystery of his will, um, which of course is the gospel itself. So gracious in and of itself is just God revealing uh, the gospel message to us. Uh, he has, uh, verse 10, he is in, the, in this fullness of time summed all things up in, in Christ and we have obtained an inheritance. Uh, we talked about this, um, I think a few weeks ago, where we talked about the inheritance that we have in Christ that uh, the inheritance for the, the Israelites was the promised land. Our inheritance is Christ and the new heavens and the new earth. Um, and of course, uh, he speaks of how we have now all these things sealed uh, for us. It is uh, a redemption and a salvation. Uh, we are God's own possession and fulfillment of Exodus 19. And those things are sealed and they are they. Are, Nothing will change that. No one can take that away from us. So just a beautiful exposition Paul has here at the very beginning of the nature of our salvation. Then in verses uh, 15 through uh, 23, through the rest of the chapter, Paul goes into a thanksgiving and a prayer. And let's, um, the prayer is that, uh, I love this prayer in verse 18, that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened so that we would know what the hope is of our calling and the riches of the glory. So he's just expounded that to them, but there's one thing to read it and to know it. It's another thing to take it to heart uh, and, and allow that to produce the fruit of hope in our lives. So as we're living in these dark times, what a wonderful thing to be able to meditate and have this prayer of Paul uh, and it's a prayer that we can pray as well, that the eyes of our heart, our understanding, our intellect, our will, as we talked about on Sunday, will be enlightened to, to understand uh, what it is that we actually have in Christ and allow that to produce hope in our lives. Then in, um, uh, by the way, uh, ver the end of this, he talks about having put all things in subjection under Jesus' feet, God putting all things in subjection under Jesus' feet. This is a reflection on Psalm 110, which speaks of the same thing. It's a messianic prediction in Psalm 110. Uh, but it, one of the things that you also see is this is also very similar in wording to what we find in Colossians. In fact, uh, you will not find two letters of Paul that are closer in content and theme uh, then the letter to the Church of Colossae and the letter to the Church at Ephesus. Uh, so these are two books that are really good to study together. And what he uh, talks about here in 
um, at the end of chapter one is really similar to what we find in Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. Then in verse two, or chapter two, uh, Paul again starts uh, continuing to expound on the salvation that we have in Christ. And I don't think you will find in the New Testament a, a clear explanation of the transformation that occurs in the gospel uh, than what we find here in chapter two, uh, verses one through 10. Uh, the first three verses speak of uh, our situation before Christ. Uh, he talks about how we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And you think about that, uh, just the miraculous uh, raising from the dead that happens in salvation, that we are literally, there's nothing we can do to raise ourselves. We are uh, at God's mercy. We are doomed in that sense. Uh, we are, sin has brought us not just physical death, but also uh, spiritual death. Uh, we were not just dead, though. We were walking, and we were, uh, you could even say we were kind of almost spiritual zombies, right? We were walking after the prince of the power of the air. In other words, we are walking in lockstep with agree in agreement with uh, the, the rulers of this world, uh, specifically Satan himself. And then finally, he talks about how we, um, we were by nature children of wrath. Uh, that phrase children of or sons of in Hebrew means that you belong to something. So we belonged to wrath. That's who we were. That's what we, uh, that was our, our destiny. Uh, and in this way, uh, Paul talks about, uh, when he talks about the world, uh, the flesh, and the, and the devil here, he's talking about the psychological, spiritual um, and um, and even um, I guess cultural, political influences that that hold us uh, back from the gospel that um, that must be broken through. Well, who, who can break through? Uh, how can we be rescued from this desperate situation of being dead in our trespasses and sins? Uh, by, uh, the situation where we are children of wrath, belonging to wrath. How, who can rescue us from? Uh, the situation that we're uh, walking in agreement with, with, uh, with, with Satan himself. Who can do this? Well, verse 4 tells us, but God. And again, it's because of the richness of his mercy and his grace uh, that escapes us. There's, uh, I've heard uh, people describe this as the, the most beautiful conjunction uh, in Scripture. Uh, the the, the uh, transformation that occurs after this is just amazing but God. And then notice what happens. But God, because of his, his great mercy, when we were dead, we were made alive. When we were falling after the prince of the power of the air, uh, we've been raised up out of this world. When we were children of wrath, we, whereas we were children of wrath, we've now been granted surpassing riches. So every dilemma that we face before Christ, but God has a solution to it. And what's the purpose of all this? Of course, it's, as chapter one tells us, it's to the praise of the glory of his grace. And as part of that, uh, Paul tells us that we are his workmanship and we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. So not only are we trophies of his grace, we're to continually display, continue to display uh, the, the glorious transformation that's occurred in our lives uh, by, by our good works. So works are, are important in our life, aren't they? The fruit is important because it shows something of the beautiful work of grace that God has done uh, in our lives. And of course, we access that because of the work of God in our lives, and it's through faith, as Paul says twice in this text, by grace, uh, through faith, uh, that, you, um, that no one may, may boast. Uh, verse 9. So, great description of, of salvation there. And then in verse 11, through the rest of the, the chapter, uh, Paul starts dealing with uh, some issues regarding uh, the, the similarity that uh, Gentiles and, and Jews uh, have, that we are uh, unified because of the gospel. And so, for instance, in chapter, uh, we'll just read through 11 and 12, therefore remember that you formally, the Gentiles of the flesh, here he's speaking specifically to the Gentiles, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, cut off from the, the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope, 
So not only did you have all this stuff, right? You were, uh, you were by nature children of wrath and all those other things, but you were also, if you're a Gentile, you are cut off from the covenant. So is there any hope? Well, by the blood of Christ, you were, verse 13, brought near. And that applies, I think, probably to most people who are listening to this, uh, who are not Jews, uh, but Gentiles. We have been brought near, and so that we can say that we are children of God. We have been adopted into that family, having an inheritance because of the work of, of Christ. And now what is he doing? He's taking us and forming us into a holy temple in the Lord, uh, verse 21. This is, a, we had our, our church um, essentials class on Sunday, and we talk about some of the different uh, metaphors of the church and, and talking about uh, the importance of the church in the, in the New Testament. And um, one of the metaphors of the church is, of course, the church is a temple of God. Now, uh, there's a number of fulfillments of the temple in the New Testament, uh, whether it's Jesus himself is the new temple, our, our bodies are temples, uh, but the church is as well. And we've been made into this temple of God. Well, what is a temple? Well, temple is a place of worship, yes, but it's more than that in the ancient world. The temple was a place where the God ruled and dwelled. And so the church is the place of, of God's rule and sovereignty. Uh, and it's the place of his presence, most of all, right? Uh, and so uh, God is present in this world, in us through the spirit, but also, um, also through his church. Uh, and uh, we have that opportunity of showing to the world uh, the difference that the presence of God and power of God in our lives uh, can make as a corporate body of Christ. Chapter three, uh, by the way, there's also, I think, some, some significant things that we could say, uh, applications we could say just based on this unity that we have in Christ that's apart from any natural um, things that, that naturally divide us. Uh, so in our world today, there are a lot of things that divide us, political, um, racial, um, even gender. You know, all these things are, are things that, that can separate us, but there's one thing that unifies us, uh, and that's the gospel. And so I think the solution to the disunity and the, uh, uh, just the uh, problems that we see in the, in the world, like things like even racism, uh, the solution to it is the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it is the solution to so many issues. Because what it does uh, is it brings it brings people together and unifies them, and that's the beauty of the gospel, right? That uh, nothing else could do this uh, but the gospel. So that when we, for instance, see a vision of the throne of God in the Book of Revelation, it includes people from every tribe, tongue, and, and nation around the throne singing praises to God. All right. Uh, chapter three uh, then moves on to uh, talking about, again, equality uh, between Jews and Gentiles in the body of Christ. And let's see if there's anything I want to specifically point out here or uh, read. Let's see. I like verse two where it talks about the stewardship of God's grace that was given to, uh, to, um, to Paul for the benefit of, uh, of the Ephesian church. But what I think that's a great word because it talks about how Paul viewed the gospel as a stewardship. It wasn't just given to him to, to enjoy for himself, but he uh, was a steward of it. And to be a good steward of it, you must share it. Um, let's see. And really the, the focus of that, the whole section in chapter three, verses one through 13 is verse six, where it talks about the, how the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise of Jesus Christ through the gospel. So there's nothing to separate Jews and, and Gentiles in that way. Um, and all this had this purpose, verse 10, uh, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities, even in the heavenly places. Angels say, wow, the wisdom of God uh, when they behold the gospel. So um, then in, in the end of chapter 3, um, Paul has a benediction uh, and another prayer and a benediction. Uh, and typically, you know, benedictions for Paul tend to end in letters, but this ends a major section in the letter. So it ends that kind of theological section. Uh, and now in chapter four, he moves on to uh, much of the, the practical that we, uh, that we have. 
uh, for the rest of the letter. And he has a therefore there. And the old saying goes, if you find a therefore, ask wherefore the therefore. And it's there because this, these things that he talks about here are the practical out, outflows uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ within the church itself. And we'll talk about some of those here in, uh, in just a minute. Um, the first thing I think I would say is this, uh, and, and this is the first thing Paul says, that he says, excuse me, that um, one of the major outflows of this is that there's a unity in spirit. And of course, you know, in the first century church, there were, there were things that were dividing the church. Uh, Jew and Gentile was probably the biggest thing that was dividing the church at times. And Paul says, no, there's because of these things, therefore, uh, because of all these things that we have in Christ, because of the blessings that are yes and amen in him, because of our great salvation, because of but God, uh, all of those, because of all those things, uh, we have had to be, verse three, diligent to preserve the unity of spirit and bond of peace. Uh, and this, I think, applies especially uh, on a local church level. Uh, as we um, understand what Christ has done for us, we need to be striving uh, for a unified um, a unified body, uh, because there is one body, verse four, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Uh, these, these truths bring us together so that, um, that, that we have uh, things that, that bring us together that are stronger than things that divide. Um, moving on in, in chapter four, he gives some more and one of the things that you'll see here is that he continues with this kind of indicative imperative pattern. He'll say, do this because of this. Um, let me see if I can and uh, give you a good example of that. Um, verse 22 is a great example. Here's the indicative. Your former manner of life, what you were, and now that you've been renewed of the mind, what should you do? Uh, lay aside the old self that's being corrupted. So here's your command, lay aside that old self, but it's because of what you have turned from and have been brought back from. Uh, some of the other uh, very famous uh, exhortations he gives in this text, this is one that's uh, popular in our house. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word is as good uh, for edification according to the need of the moment. Uh, edification, of course, is building up, encouraging. Um, that's a, probably a good admonition for all of us, uh, especially this time of, of year, uh, of four years, uh, when we're coming up to a very divisive time in our nation, uh, and just day to day, even within a church. Um, watching our, our language to make sure it's not tearing people down, but building people, building people up. Chapter five, we have another, uh, therefore, be imitators of God. What a high calling uh, that is. Uh, walk in love just as Christ also loved you, loved you. Again, indicative, imperative. The indicative is Christ loved you. The imperative is walk in love. Um, the indicative is your beloved children. The imperative is be imitators of God, your father. Um, so, Great stuff to be found here. Let me just, uh, there's, there's two things I wanna, because we're getting, getting short on time here, I wanna keep this shorter. Two things I wanna kind of uh, close on. Uh, one is the end of chapter five, where you have Paul's famous instructions on, uh, on marriage. Uh, it's a quite common marriage passage um, that people love to have preached at their weddings. But really the focus of this is a, um, the focus of this passage is the mystery of the gospel itself. In fact, he talks about the mystery here uh, is not just about marriage, but marriage was created to illustrate Christ's relationship with the church, that he laid down his life for the church. We talked about this on Sunday as well. If Christ laid down his life for the church, if he loved the church to that extent, we should also want to love what Christ loves. By the way, uh, speaking that idea of love, this is far off topic, but I wanted to mention this. Um, here's, a, here's a church that's actually commended. Uh, if you look back at what Paul thanks God for uh, on behalf of this church, 
It's because that he thanks them for thanks God for their love uh, that they have shown to each other. And if you turn uh, over to a few pages to the book of Revelation to Revelation two, uh, this is the same church that receives the letter uh, that is from Jesus, uh, where they are accused of leaving their first love. So. Love is something that needs to be, it's almost a spiritual discipline, isn't it? It needs to be maintained, needs to be cultivated, needs to, needs to be pursued uh, in a corporate body of faith. So, um, but this is a challenging text, of course, for, for husbands and wives as well, uh, as we are to uh, seek to, husbands seeking to love uh, their wives as Christ loved the church, being willing to even lay down their lives for the wives and the wives following the leadership of the husbands. Uh, and this is a, it's a hard countercultural text for today, isn't it? And yet, uh, if it was followed, uh, how beautiful our, our marriages could be. And as I, I tell my students quite a bit, uh, marriage uh, is a, a beautiful display of the gospel to a watching world. Uh, not only displays uh, the power of God to redeem, uh, bringing two sinners together and making it work, uh, it also shows the, the uh, beauty of Christ's relationship with the church when it works well. And so there's a, quite the onus on uh, husbands and wives uh, to, uh, to uh, illustrate well to the watching world uh, the beauty of the gospel. And then finally, of course, in Ephesians, we have the famous uh, armor of God text. Here I would encourage you uh, not necessarily to just get so caught up in the actual armor and the and the uh, the analogy that's being used here, uh, but uh, I would encourage you to look at the total, totality of it, uh, that God has, has equipped us through his grace uh, to uh, live in this world in such a way, this world that, that comes with many temptations in the spiritual realm. He's, he's equipped us uh, with the tools uh, to, uh, to engage in appropriate spiritual warfare. Uh, and it is, it is warfare. We are the church uh, triumphant, right? We, we know that our victory is here uh, in Christ. Uh, we, we know the victory is won, uh, but we're still in the war, uh, and we're the church militant in that way. Not in the sense that we're fighting a physical war at all. We are fighting a spiritual war against the powers and principalities of this age, and God has equipped us to do that as a church, as individuals too, yes, but as a church, uh, he has given us things like righteousness and faith uh, and the scriptures themselves uh, as, um, as tools to use in this, uh, this spiritual battle that we're engaged in. Uh, and of course, uh, we do all of this for the praise of the glory of his grace. So I hope you've enjoyed this study of Ephesians. Uh, there's obviously much more we could have gone into. Uh, and if you have questions or comments, feel free to drop those into the, into the comment box. Uh, here on Facebook or on YouTube, uh, and we'll try to answer those. Uh, but I hope you enjoy uh, just studying it, going back through it yourself. And if you need some tools to study it, let me know, and I'll, I'll uh, point you in the right direction there as well. Uh, but I hope, you, I hope you have a great rest of the week. I hope to see many of you on Sunday as we celebrate the Lord's Supper.